Thank you for coming. Uh, we're fortunate to have Dr. Kearns with us today. He's from Tampa, Florida. He was a professor at the University of South Florida and took an interest in Fox in 2018. This is a man that's going to move rapidly. And his first slide he showed today, to me, was so beautifully seductive. So this is an article in the making. This is somebody that's going to continue to be part of our progress progress forward into education. Uh, so without much else to say, we'll stay at the Fox. His history is fascinating. So if you get a chance to talk to him personally, do that. Dr. Kern? Yes, sir. You're on the show. Yeah. All right. Thank and you. I do appreciate your coming. Thank you, Ken. It's a wonderful, it's a great pleasure to be here, and thank you for coming this morning. Uh, as Ken said, I was a university professor at uh, USF for a period of about 29 years, and I uh, published well over 100 articles in uh, a variety of uh, peer-reviewed journals and the rest. But uh, moving into horology was a challenge all in its own self. And this morning, I wanted to talk to you about uh, what has become a, sort of a passion of mine, and really uh, more of a, not so much a, a anything other than a resurrection, if you will, it's really more than a restoration of, a, uh, of an ancient clock that I came by uh, through the uh, antique American clocks and uh, Todd Porter uh, when I originally purchased it. So let's talk a little bit about the clockmaker. Andres Vermeulen uh, lived from 1680 to 1752. He was from Germany and uh, had come to Amsterdam prior to 1708. It's kind of a critical date, and I want you to just remember that as we get further into the discussion. Uh, in 1716, he was part of a, the Registry of Good Men, which was put together by the other clockmakers uh, in Amsterdam uh, for the benefit of the local administrators, such that they can essentially uh, see that they're, they're highly ethical business people and are eligible for uh, running for positions like the mayor and the like in town. Um, Vermeulen made diverse pieces, uh, some of which were very elaborate astronomical clocks and of course the current musical clock, uh, which has fewer complications than some of the ones that I'll show you. Uh, Vermeulen's works uh, are in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam uh, and are quite beautiful to look at, as you will see. Uh, they're considered national treasures. Uh, one such work uh, shows a really fine dual uh, technique, uh, which is this one, as you can see, uh, which is in the Rijksmuseum. This is the face of that particular clock, and it should give you some idea of the different complications that are uh, in effect on it. Uh, notice that there's very little remaining of the bells in the back of this for the production of music. This is the rear view of the same clock. The name of uh, Bert Dagenar uh, will show up from time to time. Uh, Bert is a, uh, a colleague of mine, a horologist, and is uh, very much connected with the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, and has provided a considerable amount of uh, help to me in terms of the restoration of this clock, which uh, spanned a couple of continents and has uh, taken up most of my last two years. Dagenar himself actually owns the companion clock to the one that I just showed you that was in the Rijksmuseum. So this is his, and you'll notice the difference in terms of the, um, the artistry on the top of the, uh, the case, the figures. One of the things that's interesting about Dagenar's clock is that he also has his own pin barrels that he has made up, as you can see here, and that Vermeulen also made a piece of furniture in order to hold the additional pin barrels, which can be swapped out. So it was a rather a nice feature in the sense that these were the major home entertainment pieces of the time. Some of these, I don't know if you can read the, uh, the writing on the right, but he has uh, created some of his own pin barrels which include a whiter shade of pale, uh, let's see, um, yeah, painted black, and a couple of other 
uh, rock and roll pieces, uh, which she had provided to me, uh, the audio files, which I happen to have on the computer, but I'm not going to play right now. So carillons in the Netherlands were really all the rage. They used to uh, have uh, opportunities for the local uh, individuals, the, the local citizenry, to gather around uh, the bell tower and uh, have performances daily uh, during the summer months. When the weather was nice in the evening, they might have up to two different uh, performances in a week. Um, in Florida, of course, we have Bach Tower, so we've got, been keeping the tradition alive to some extent. One of the things that you'll see here as well, we've just lost our projector, this is what I was worried about. Um, these particular large carillons were also automated. So this one in particular is in Ghent, and the individual pins in the side of the barrel, the barrel measuring probably about 10 to 12 feet in diameter, can be slipped in and out uh, to change the music. So you have different uh, musical numbers which can be played on the hour by the uh, clockwork mechanism. And that, that runs up through a series of cables back to the bells. One of the advantages, of course, for the uh, uh, agricultural workers in the area is that once the music begins to sound in the tower, it carries on the wind, and so if you're out in fields working, it would draw your attention to say, oh, well, okay, I, I hear that song. Uh, when it finishes, it's going to strike the hour, so I'll know if it's noon or if it's 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock or is it time to quit work for the day and these sorts of things. So they had a very, uh, very good functional uh, reason for having those devices in addition to them having the entertainment value. So the, once they were converted into clocks, the move was really to create these as home entertainment devices for the wealthy, if you will. The opportunity to have uh, music in your home anytime that you wanted to. Um, and some of these songs might be the kind that you could put on for the benefit of the pastor when he came to have dinner on Sunday. Other ones might be bawdy music that you would have friends over and while you're having cigars or smoking a pipe uh, with them and cognac, you know, you'd all sing these bawdy and raucous songs. So the, the pin barrels could be made up specifically for a person's taste. So for in my case, in my clock, there are a couple that are marked favorite and those are typically the ones where the owner has specified which particular pieces of music he wants to have encoded on the barrel. So one of the things I want to take just a small sidelight on is uh, a little discussion about this gentleman, who is Daniel Quare. Uh, Daniel Quare uh, uh, was operating in England about that time that uh, Vermeulen was involved. And uh, of course, the English have a very different way of managing clock production than the Dutch do. Uh, of course, everything was controlled by guilds, and that was uh, around about, I think, early 1600s. Uh, the Worshipful Company of Clockmakers was created. And by 1708, um, Daniel Quare had become the seventh master of the Worshipful Company of Clockmakers. And what's important about this is uh, Quare himself was a Quaker, and uh, he was persecuted by the church and uh, actually by the administration, uh, he had as much as uh, about almost 50% of his holdings confiscated as a fine for attending religious services. So he was having problems there uh, earlier in his life, but by 1703, Queen Anne uh, ascended to the throne, and she was a Protestant and looked more favorably upon him. And by 1708, he became the, uh, uh, the seventh master of the Worshipful Company of Clockmakers. But one of the things that's, that I reason that I bring this up is because of this rather ironic situation, which is that during that time, I was asked by David Boyd to uh, take on the restoration of a Daniel Quare clock at our facility, uh, which is a one-year 
clock, which strikes on the hour and has complications for the uh, porthole moon dial as well as a uh, date function on this. So, you know, getting uh, one of these clocks to run over a period of years is a bit of a challenge, as you can imagine. Uh, they're very delicately balanced devices, but we have it up and going, and we're looking actually for a buyer uh, for that. So that's something that we can come back to later. But we think at that time that uh, it would have been likely that Vermeulen and Quare might have heard of each other, if not had met each other at that time, since Vermeulen by about 1708 and later, uh, had become the highest paid clockmaker in Amsterdam. And so there was, was intense competition going on between the Dutch and the English. So let's take a look at what my clock looked like when it arrived on the scene. As you can see, it wasn't in very good shape. Uh, as a matter of fact, you can notice on, from the left that virtually all of the bells and the hammers and the um, keyframe are not there. The, um, there's only, of course, two cables there for the three trains, and these seem to be some issues with the projector, I'm sorry about. Um, of course, the, the case was in a really rough shape, um, and of course, you know, the the face and the rest of it needed work. So you can see that it was really more of a basket case at that time. So let me list off here, as you can see, some of the deficiencies. So no bells, no hammers, no keyframe, no music selector mechanism. We had no idea what the music was that was encoded on this barrel. This was a complete enigma. Uh, we didn't know where the hammers were supposed to be with respect to the unknown bells. So there are a lot of variables in this equation. Um, one of the other issues was that this particular clock had been in a fire. The case had been scorched. It had fallen over, and the plates um, on the pillars were, were bent relative to each other, so the gears would not mesh, the, the wheels, I should say. And, of course, the music train was inactive. So I looked at this and thought to myself, what the hell have I bought? <laughs> uh, in addition, of course, you know, the one corner of the face was chipped from a fall, as you would be able to see, the backboard was split. Someone had put uh, plastic over the vents on the side of the hood, here where this is, nice filigree is, um, to, presumably to reduce the sound of the bells at one point or another. And of course, the veneer was all peeling off and falling on the floor. So it was less than a, a beautiful piece at that time. So being a university professor, one of the things that they teach us is how to find information anywhere in the world. And it's a, it's a good skill to have, especially when you're starting with something that is a, a big mystery. This is like an Agatha Christie. You know, you have no idea what the heck it's supposed to look like. Uh, when I purchased it from Todd, he told me that, uh, that he thought that there was supposed to be a, a comb, like a music box, up here across the top. Uh, I didn't realize that bells were supposed, supposed to be there, and he thought it would be just be a simple matter of getting a comb and it would play. And uh, the more I looked at, at uh, this maker and others about that era, I realized, of course, that that was not at all the case. So I went and acquired uh, three different texts from NAWCC. Um, C's Smith book uh, on Spielwerk vor uh, ein Freies Startklock, uh, which is unfortunately out of print, but uh, NAWCC did have a copy of it in, in Dutch, which uh, I made use of Google Translate quite a bit and picked up some Dutch in the process. Uh, Ord Hume's wonderful book on restoring musical clocks and and uh, music boxes. And of course, uh, Winkle and Sullivan's text on the music of early American clocks. And I found that Smith's book in Dutch uh, was actually probably the, the best for our purposes in the sense that he takes you through the whole process of building a musical clock from scratch. In other words, how are the hammers constructed and what different strategies were in use by the Dutch. And so that sort of gave me the uh, the, the courage to try making some of my own. 
The other thing I did, and this was uh, probably where things get really interesting, is that I formed a formal relationship with the uh, curator of the uh, Spielklock Museum in Utrecht. And the Spielklock Museum, if you have never been there, uh, specializes in musical clocks. They have a large uh, uh, selection. And uh, Mariki um, uh, Lefebvre Morseman uh, was the curator at that time, and I hired her to evaluate the barrel on this particular clock. And what she had me do was take photographs, high resolution photographs of the entire barrel, rotating it about 15 or 20 degrees, snapping another one and so forth, until she had a, a full uh, 3D reconstruction she could do. And from that, over a period of the next four months, she was able to decipher what music was actually on the barrel and tell me what bells I would need in what order and also how many hammers per bell and in what order these needed to be placed in the keyframe. So once we had all of this information, it became just really more of a matter of going through the process of fabricating it. And I made uh, close friends with a colleague of mine by the name of uh, Tom English. And uh, Tom is a retired master machinist from, uh, uh, actually worked for Anheuser-Busch for many years setting up assembly lines and the rest and has an absolutely astonishing shop of his own, including a Bridgeport mill and a variety of other uh, high-end tools. And using his Bridgeport, we went through and cut a, a keyframe and made the individual hammers for this device um, one at a time. And there was an awful lot of work that was done as far as actually machining these and filing them by hand in order to get them to line up. Because one of the things that is true about this particular clock is the fact that all of the scribe lines that are on here that tell you which tracks are which um, are not evenly spaced, as you would expect if you had a high precision type device laying this out. This was all done manually, so you know the keyframe may or may not be exactly where it should be. So it required a lot of individual placement and work in order to get the, uh, the hammers to line up with the tracks as they should be. And then, of course, uh, there's the process of fabricating the heads, which were done in brass, um, all involving uh, a small hole in the end through which I uh, basically created a, uh, a steel shaft and uh, silver soldered those in the end. I know silver solder's not popular with a lot of people, but I wanted something that would have uh, a fair amount of strength and be able to uh, last for the rest of my life anyway, with minimum problems. Now the acquisition of the bells was quite another story. Now that I know about what the bell ranges are supposed to be and how many hammers are supposed to be where, there comes the question of where do you acquire a set of bells where you're going to get enough of them that you're going to be able to meet the requirements as I have listed there. These are the different keys um, in the different locations. And of course, you know, I've turned at this point to eBay and uh, actually found a gentleman who was selling a, a bell set of nested bells for uh, 30 bells, which seemed to probably like there was going to be enough to give me 14 out of that that would work for me. And so I took a flyer with this, a rather expensive one, and fortunately I was rewarded. We were actually were able to find the correct uh, bell set out of that. Pitching the bells was another matter, making absolutely sure we had what we thought we had. Uh, one of my colleagues, and this uh, is the third individual that I've been working with, is uh, Bill Patterson. Uh, Bill is a concert level violinist who has played in uh, Lincoln Center and in Carnegie Hall. And uh, he came by with his violin and we sat and pitched every one of the bells 
to make sure absolutely that we had what we thought we did. And so I had a pretty fair amount of confidence by the time I was done that we were going to have the correct set of bells in the right order. Now, the, the music selector itself was, uh, was also a bit of a problem because obviously it was missing. We really didn't know exactly what it was going to look like. Uh, there were some photos that were volunteered to me uh, by uh, Mariki uh, Morseman uh, from the Spielkalak Museum of the uh, Vermeulen that they had in their collection. Um, but we really weren't sure how the selector hand here, which was only connected to the snail on the inside and nothing else, was supposed to magically transform its movement into a lateral movement of the barrel. So we went through a number of iterations in terms of the design and ultimately came up with this device. Uh, this is a picture also of my colleague uh, Tom uh, working with the bridge board and, uh, and cutting out the, uh, the pieces before we actually manufactured it and set it up to read the snail and translate that into the lateral motion of the barrel, which worked out quite nicely. So at that point, you know, the real process of a, kind of a standard rebuilding began. I mean, now we had the pieces, we could put this back together but there were a lot of problems. I don't know if you can see this, but uh, in the center here, you can see that everything is kind of canted to the right. That's because of the fall, which caused the plates to move relative to each other. So I was really worried about how we were going to be able to straighten this up and get the wheels to mesh again, because clearly they're not meshing on the left side, which is the area where the music train is? Well, the answer is a 32 pound or 32 ton press and very, very gentle pressure application. Um, we clamped the, uh, the uh, plate with the uh, pillars anchored to it, to the side of it, and actually used the, uh, the other plate, the companion to it and pinned that in place and then applied pressure until it just overshot, but very, very gradually and very slowly. And we were rewarded. I mean, none of the pillars cracked, none of them came loose. I, I was very much afraid that we were going to lose the, uh, the whole project if, uh, if those started breaking loose on us, but they didn't. The Dutch made those clocks well. So after that, of course, the plates and the wheels were sent through the, uh, the ultrasound, cleaned up, and polished and lacquered. One of the other things that I wanted to uh, mention was we also had to replace the pendulum and sub suspension block, which was this uh, rather hideous contraption. Let's see if I can find it here. I did bring it. Uh, I'm gonna pass this around. Just a moment. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, you know what? All I can tell you is, uh, I'll fish it out later, it, it's as bad as what it looks like, which is it was literally just a, uh, a, a brass strip that had a number of right angle bends in it and uh, another piece that was soldered to the top of it and slapped on the back. Clearly, that was not going to uh, not going to stay on the clock. Uh, working with my machinist colleagues, uh, we actually fabricated one that was much closer to what Vermeulen originally used, and that appears here, and which works quite well. Um, yes. So the other thing that that happened is we got this up and running. Uh, and of course was just checking out timekeeping first. And I decided to engage the strike to see what this would sound like. And all of a sudden I came to the conclusion that something seemed like it was very, very wrong. I was hearing the hour being struck twice, once at 
half past the hour and once at the top of the hour. And it turned out that that was not an error. As a matter of fact, I found out that the Dutch teach timekeeping to their children differently than we do. We say, for example, it's half past the hour, it's 7.30. What the Dutch say is it's half eight. So what happens is that they do their arrangement where eight o'clock would be struck on a high-pitched bell at 7.30, and then at 8 p.m., the large bell on the back of the clock rings the hour again. So you hear the same hour twice, but you hear it on the high-pitched bell a half hour before. So that sort of explained that. And unfortunately, again, having a Dutch colleague, that helped quite a bit. So the next step, of course, as we're moving through this, is we have to get the our restorer working on the on the case because it's in an awful shape. You know the veneer is peeling off of it. Uh, you know I'm I have my concerns that with all the additional weight that this 300 year old case is going to just crumble. So I made the association of uh, a master restorer by the name of David Norris, and David has worked with Boyd Clocks. Uh, for many years, and he is probably the finest restoration expert in woodwork uh, in the Tampa Bay area. I would highly recommend him uh, for anyone there. He uh, was trained at the Winter Thur Museum and was asked to become the curator when he had completed his training. And he turned it down and went private. You know, his intent was to produce fine work here in the Tampa Bay area, and he just did an absolutely astonishing job on the case. One of the things also was that we did not have the correct fret work from that era uh, anywhere on this clock. There were only a few tiny pieces of it. So Paul Vandenzee, uh, who is in Amsterdam, uh, and I were communicating. He's also a Dutch horologist, and he had been restoring a tall case clock in the Netherlands and had put together a CAD CAM rendition of the fretwork. And one of the individuals who works with us at our shop uh, is uh, Grant Posner, and he is a uh, master with laser cutting. And we were able to take the laser cutting device, made it with Paul Vanderzee's CAD CAM, and size it for the openings that we had here, and have the woodwork cut to produce the fretwork necessary to restore this to the original uh, type of fretwork that was used by the Dutch in that era. So. Grant Posner's uh, machine had actually taken what would have probably taken a day or so of hard work sawing that out and to actually cut these lovely panels in the hood in a period of about three minutes each, which is nothing sort of amazing. The uh, veneer on which they're cut is actually veneer that was period correct. So it's from wood that's about 300 years old that David had managed to source and to create the, uh, the necessary uh, material for the fretwork. So David's work consisted, of course, of taking our derelict case, and you can see that it was in pretty rough shape when they started, and doing miraculous things with it. And you can see this is going through just several of the stages, which I'm sure many of you who are involved in woodwork and restoration know these well, of removing the veneer, resecuring, and using period correct uh, glues and resins in order to restore the case, and then reapplying the veneer 
where appropriate and also finishing it out with period correct veneer in those areas which needed new veneer to be added. This particular hood, by the way, I should tell you, was very challenging. You'll notice that in the top areas there on the crown, uh, those are now open. It turned out that they were always supposed to be open, but somewhere along the line, somebody veneered those over. And it's, again, probably the same person who put the plastic in the side vents. So that was all removed. And then, of course, we had the uh, appropriate uh, filigree uh, along with the uh, white silk background for the era. This is, uh, again, David Norris uh, applying the final touches. He did a beautiful job on this, uh, did a French rub on it, and brought it up, so as you can see. And the base came out beautifully as well. The door. David's just an absolute master at this. He's just, just does superb work. One of the other things that needed to be done was the uh, the hood was lacking a latch for it. It turns out that the Dutch did things a little different. Not surprisingly, um, they actually had a, a latch that goes through the door and then connects to a pin underneath, and. Um, Typically what happens is you have a cord on the back of that and you can pull that down and it releases the front door. Um, I employed um, a fellow by the name of Ryan Adams who is a blacksmith up in Maine and Ryan made that from scratch uh, using an image of one provided by Paul Vandenzee uh, over in uh, Amsterdam. and so. He gave us a, the image of one of his uh, clocks, and Ryan was able to duplicate that. One of the other things was uh, the uh, front door uh, of the uh, case was also damaged. The, um, one of the two hinges was broken and had been kind of put together as a bodge, and it was really pretty awful and I really didn't want to put anything like that back in there so I uh, re-engineered a mating piece for it and uh, matched it up uh, using my mill and created a final uh, product which you can see there is the one on the right versus the, uh, the undamaged one on the left. So we were able to get that resurrected as well. So. After all was said and done, um, I went through and played the music for the Spiel Clock and, uh, Museum and recorded that. Uh, took each of the 14 bells and had them struck and sent that back over to Mariki and her colleagues and said, what do you think? And they said, well, nice try, but you've got a little bit more work to do. So a couple of the bells were not quite what they think they should be, and they have corrected uh, me. And so my next step on this, because this is a kind of an ongoing process, is going to be to uh, tune some of the bells that are slightly out. And I have some substitute bells, uh, fortunately, of the uh, 16 remaining bells that can be put in uh, to replace the ones that are considerably out of tune. Uh, of, of course, the other thing that I'm looking for during this meet is a 10-pound uh, weight with a brass shell from around about 300 years. Uh, so, so if anybody knows anyone out there who might have such a weight, uh, I'm in the market. Finally, I wanted to treat everybody here to uh, this and see if I can get this to play. Uh, is Ken here? Yeah, fine. Yeah. Is the audio on the... Yeah, it's fine. Ah, there we go. Hmm. The light out, but it's probably the cord. It's a little faint. But this is one of the minuets, and the clock does play the minuets on the hour now. So, 
And it does prior to striking. So it's, uh, so it's back and playing again for the first time in probably a couple of hundred years, I would say, from the looks of it. So I would like to close and say thank you for entertaining me. Open, open the floor to questions. Yes, sir. What wonderful chat. I'm just wondering, do you know how that clock came to the U.S.? Uh, actually, I do not. Um, I tried to find out from Todd, and he provided me with the name of an individual to contact. Um, I did contact him, and he said, that wasn't my clock, and I don't know how you managed to get my address. So. <laughs> <laughs> but from what I heard from Todd, he said that... Uh, said that it had been in the person's family for a long time, uh, that um, his father, the person's father had it, and that uh, they just wanted to get rid of it. So, you know, it was, it was one of these things, I'll, I'll be honest with you, when I saw it at first, I was uh, sort of like a little askance. Uh, I mean, it was, uh, they had a high starting bid and I looked and said, you know, this is probably more than I should really bite off, but I need a challenge. And, uh, and this certainly was one. Um, and I've certainly put an awful lot of time and treasure into it in terms of bringing it back, but I've been trying to do it the right way. The, um, the work that we had to do, for the most part, again, just to recap, was you know the the entire music selector mechanism was missing, as was the key frame, all of the hammers, and the bells. So, so basically, that was gone. The mechanism itself uh, was completely inactive because the plates were bent; nothing would engage. Uh, it was it was a mess. Yes, sir. Did you uh, say how many tones? I'm sorry. How many tones? Oh, uh, it plays 12 different pieces. Yes. On that one barrel? All on one barrel, yes. And, and that's another interesting point. The, when I got this, and this is one of the things that was giving me ulcers, um, there are pinpricks in the barrel to tell you where the tracks are. And they're not in the first 12, they're actually in the second 12 of the scribe lines. But in this particular case, there was a 13th prick in the barrel. So I'm looking at this and thinking, 12 songs, 13 positions. Do they have a calibration track in there? Is that what they did? And the other problem was, by the time you counted up all of the scribe lines that would tell you whether it's divisible by 12 or is it divisible by 13, it turned out that it was that the total number of scribe lines was actually a multiple of either 12 or 13. So that told you no, no information either. So it could have still been either one. So you know, I spent a lot of sleepless nights wondering, you know, like what should the keyframe look like? Are we basing this on a, you know, 12 tracks between each between each hammer or 13 tracks? And fortunately, Mariki uh, uh, Lefebvre, uh, Morseman, was able to nail it down. She said, no, definitely it's 12. And so went from there. Yes, sir. How long did this project take? Uh, I started on this in uh, January of 2020. So it was right about this time COVID started. And you know, a lot of it was research research, research, you know, and a lot of reading. Uh, then, of course, there were the false starts. You know, we, we came up with a couple of different designs for the keyframe, how to actually make this uh, function the same way. It's not, it's not a genuine keyframe from that era, nor did I have the uh, engineering specifications for one. This is actually my own design, but it, it worked and works well. Um, so it's really gone on over a period of the last, oh, what, two and a half, three years now, close to it. Uh, yes, sir. Um, really enjoy your talk. Thank you. And, and um, who advised you that the hammer tails would be, you said, brass? No, the, the hammer tails are not brass. The hammer heads are brass. <laughs> okay. So the, 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 
The tails are steel. And, and did you temper no, no, I, I did not. As a matter of fact, the um, how I set that up is kind of interesting. Um, I went through a lot of different spring material, looking for the the correct uh, amount of tension because I wanted to go as light as possible, given the age of the brass, to have absolutely minimal. Uh, force on those pins. I didn't want to shear any of them off. And in my quest to find the right spring, I uncovered uh, an old wooden box in my workshop that I opened up that belonged to my grandfather. And in it were some pocket watches and some other clock tools. And I realized my grandfather had been into this too. And there was a mainspring that was in there that was about, uh, oh, I'd say about a quarter of an inch in width. It was very thin and also very springy, but you know, not too bad. And I said, you know, damn, this is absolutely perfect for this. So my grandfather, who was a bit of a horology nut himself, contributed to the restoration of this clock <laughs> through this, which is really great. Yes, Jay. Right. As opposed to the English, which, you know, they're, they're di and maybe that's my ear as opposed to um, a Dutch one. It's interesting because there is actually a Dutch database of folk music. And you can go out and listen to many of the different pieces. And several of the pieces uh, that are on this uh, are in that database. My favorite is, uh, is the Minuet in Entree. And uh, that was the one that actually was played on here. And once I finally get the last three bells in there in the correct order, I have a feeling it'll be even more enjoyable. But I, I love hearing it. And uh, sometimes, because I've got probably about 20 clocks in my house that I keep running, I'll turn off the strike and just listen for the, uh, for the minuet on the hour. It's really very pleasing. Yes, sir? Bill, out of order. I'm not coming anywhere close to you. <laughs> no, Todd. I, actually, no. Th th this this is a wonderful challenge. Please go ahead. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't get more information for you when I sold that to you. But uh, where's it going to be next? Are you keeping it or are you? Well, you know, here's the. I've run into one small problem. Uh, fully assembled uh, with the hood on, and it's about nine feet tall, and I've got an eight foot ceiling in my house. <laughs> So my next job is to find a carpenter who can adjust my ceiling up so I can find a, put a little alcove in it and put it there because I, I hope to have it in my home for a long time. Thank you. Yes, sir, Jay. With fires are incredibly destructive you know, for anything, but right. was there any analysis because the, I assume because the, the brass was hammered, you know, it had a certain degree of I didn't see anything that would suggest to me that it had been uh, badly harmed by that. The case was scorched on the outside. I would think if it got hot enough to really do serious damage to the brass, it probably would have incinerated the hood. Uh, I, I, I would hope you'd be right. It, see, I started to think a little bit about what probably happened in the history of this clock. And what I believe may have occurred was that there was a fire in the house. The clock fell over during the fire and was damaged. And the chip was taken out of the side of the face. The plates were bent. And after the fire was over, the person probably took it to a clockmaker and said, can you make it run again? Yeah. And looking at how badly bent the plates were, he would probably have said, 
we could probably get it to run and maybe strike the hour, but that's it. And you know, the, the music's not gonna work again because that portion of it was badly mangled. I suspect like all good clockmakers, the clockmaker said, we'll take the bells off, we'll keep them here along with these other pieces that we can reuse and give the clock back to you and it'll run, but uh, you know we're gonna basically remove these other pieces that don't do anything now. And that's probably where they went and why they probably wound up on some other clock elsewhere, you know, and, and then just, they're probably in the home of somebody else. So what was ultimately passed down was a clock that was missing, you know, a good 25, 30% of the mechanism. And that's what I got when I bought it from Todd. So then the, the issue was, you know, how do you put it back together? What should be there? And that's really where the research came in. And it, a lot of patient digging and a lot of talking with people. And, and, you know, it was a real educational process. I mean, it was a lot of fun. And, uh, and, I, and I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I'd do it again in a heartbeat. David? Yes, please. Here. I got to watch this process. Um, I'm going to use my outdoor voice. Okay. Um, one of the things he didn't mention was he also restored the dial and did the silvering. So that's all Bill's work also. Um, David Norrie is the fellow who did the uh, refinishing. Um, Dr. Kearns did not mention that he's third generation, and uh, our clock shop had worked with the Norris family um, for about the last 70, 75 years. Now, Irving Nori started the Nori's uh, refinishing business, I think it was 1919. Um, and his son, uh, let's see, it was, uh, it was Charles Nori, it was his son, and then David Nori was the grandson. David Nori and I got into our family's businesses about the same time. And I remember seeing some of David's early work thinking, he's got a ways to go. And then, of course, I see some of my early works, and I'm thinking, yeah, okay, that's pretty amateur. Um, but that being said, um, Along comes a Daniel Quare, a, a year duration clock that we had the great fortune of having coming into our shop for restoration, which we've worked on several years, um, and also for it to be consigned. Um, the Daniel Quare case was also in rough shape, and upon seeing it and knowing the stature of the clock, I knew there was only one person in, in Florida that I would want to handle the job, and that was Dave Norris. David had retired. So he didn't have his shop open to the public anymore. So I took the clock to his house uh, without him knowing I was taking it. His son was there and I thought, perfect, he's not even here to say no. So I'm gonna drop this off and insist that he do the restoration, which he did. Um, unbeknownst to me at the time, his son was actually a little interested in getting into the refinish business. So I encouraged him. I said, you have no idea what you have in your hand here. If you so desire to get into the refinishing business, you will never have to advertise. You're gonna learn things that you can't learn anywhere else. And please have your dad restore this Daniel Queer case <laughs> for me. So uh, David Norris got involved with the Daniel Queer and of course came into the shop uh, to learn more about the man himself and what he was dealing with and what kind of a museum piece it was. And that's where he got uh, to be friends with Dr. Kearns at the same time. And, uh, and David did a beautiful job on this Daniel Quare, which uh, we are finishing or have finished as we speak. Dr. Kearns also did all the refinishing and rebuilding of the Daniel Quare, and it's of this level of restoration now, and it is running very nicely. Uh, we've done the math recently, and I can't remember how many times a clock strikes uh, on one line if it runs a, a year, but the ticks and the strikes are, are astronomical numbers. Um, so I just wanted to add that. Um, you said weights. Did the weights you found in the shop not? Um, uh, they, they were fine for the music train and for the strikes. And I'm just looking oh, you're looking for one more? Right, right. Just the going train is an 18 movement. It seems to be about 10 pounds. Okay. Uh, Dr. Kearns had looked around, uh, what was it, you, to get the two weights that you did find? Right, right. And I had contacted a couple of uh, suppliers in the Netherlands and elsewhere, um, and I had estimated, well, I had worked out minimum necessary to drive it, it's about 20 pounds on each of the weights. And uh, they had come back and said, well, the closest we can get you is probably about 17 pounds. And uh, good luck. And so I was a little bit down in the dumps. And, and the 
Boston, go out of the shop, and uh, came up to where we, our horses were in the front. I noticed that there were these two really ratty looking lead weights that uh, the lead on the top had all started to uh, oxidize. So we got a nice white powder all the time. Now that's a, something you don't want to have around children, but So we had some test weights in our shop that were of uh, a correct period, is it, or close? Yes, uh, I would say from the looks of those that they would have been uh, at least a couple hundred years old. They're at least a couple hundred years old, and uh, we have sitting next to our horses as test weights. You know, it's, it's, when we go and pick up uh, grandfather clocks or tall case clocks at customers' house, houses, we just take the mechanics. We don't take the dial. Very often we won't even take the hands. We will take the pendulum for timekeeping, but we don't even take the weights because we have all that kind of stuff in the shop uh, for testing and bench testing uh, stuff. But anyway, I want to say that, uh, you know, Boyd Cox uh, has been in Tampa 79 years now in business. Uh, we were there because of the pandemic. My father got polio in 1949, but was very mechanical and figured, well, Fox was something you do at a bench. And uh, I got into it as a youngster because dad was in a wheelchair. Um, anyway, we've been in business a long time, and I just want to tell you it's an honor to have Dr. Kearns working in the shop to bring his uh, level of professionalism and uh, care and love for the art of restoration. Thank you for letting me. Oh, um, Dr. Kearns and I are going to do a, pro uh, a program on the Antikythera mechanism uh, tomorrow, I think at 2. Yes. And uh, anyway, I'm well, to plug that, so uh, <laughs> two o'clock tomorrow, we'll be giving a talk and get uh, that means uh, it looks like your uh, new work is oxidized. Did you patinate it? How did you do it? Uh, I'm sorry? Did you patinate the, the, your new parts? They look like they're dark. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I'm sorry. The my... parts that you made, are they patinated? Did you patinate them? And how did you do it? Uh, oh, you mean patented? Or... No, I mean, Oh, 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 no, 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 it, it's just whatever they acquired, they acquired naturally since I, since I put those together. Yeah, <laughs> no, that wasn't an intent to, uh, to you know, to, to pull anybody aside and, or put one over on anybody. That's just the way that they managed to mature. Thank you. Hey, how are you?